Thanks everybody for joining us uh, under these very difficult times. It's nice to be able to continue the constitutional conversation uh, tradition, even though we're doing it for the first time virtually. Uh, and we're really delighted today to have uh, one of our very own experts on election law, uh, Nate Persley, uh, who's the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law here at the law school um, and specializes in um, all matters of election administration. And so he's going to talk to us today about uh, COVID-19 and how that might affect uh, the 2020 election. So take it away. Oh, and I'll just say before you start, Nate, um, we're going to take questions in the ordinary way that we normally do uh, after the speaker is done talking. And the way to put yourself on the queue is to click raise hand um, in the uh, right hand side of the screen. And if you can't find that, you can send me a private chat in the window and I'll add you to the queue. And then when it's your turn to ask a question, uh, I have the ability to unmute you uh, and we'll give you the chance to ask your question to Nate. Okay, take it away, Nate. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us and thanks to the Con Law Center for having me. Um, some of you have come to some of my other talks uh, that preceded this, um, and I should say that I had expected that most of this year, uh, up until the election, I would be working in my role as director of the Stanford Cyber Policy Center, particularly focused on questions of misinformation, foreign interference, political advertising, uh, and the like. Uh, but when the pandemic hit, I um, pretty much dropped all of that and have just been working in my capacity as someone who does work on election administration and the nuts and bolts of elections. Um, I was the research director of the Presidential Commission on Election Administration in 2013, and that was a commission that um, was a bipartisan commission set up by Bob Bauer, the former White House counsel under President Obama and Ben Ginsburg, who was the lawyer to both the Romney and Bush campaigns. And that was the last commission, sort of electoral commission at the national level. And it dealt with things like long lines and polling places, as well as preparing for natural disasters in voting. Uh, and and uh, since I'd moved to Stanford uh, several years ago, I had pretty much put that aside and focused on these questions of, can democracy survive the internet? Uh, but now, because these questions of election administration have become front and center because of the pandemic, uh, I, along with uh, another team led by Charles Stewart at MIT, have been putting together a project, the Stam Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project, uh, that you can see at healthyelections.org, where we are trying to put together a coalition of academics and election officials to try to address uh, the the obstacles that remain to holding a healthy election uh, in the fall. And I should say, I, I, I view this problem as, as a uh, you know, very serious challenge that we need to confront. Um, I think it requires many billions of dollars and a lot of time and effort. Um, but if we start preparing right now, uh, we as a country can pull off this election. So let me describe what the problem is as I see it, and then talk about the different solutions and what the challenges are in executing them. So just to focus on what the actual problem is. So the question is, in the midst of the pandemic, what steps should states and localities take for the, um, what should they take, steps should they take now for the likelihood that sizable shares of the population are not gonna be able to vote safely in 2020 in the same way as they have in recent elections. And each part of that sentence is important, that voters are accustomed to voting in a particular way. Um, localities are accustomed to running elections in a particular way. How do we make the transition to a different electoral system in a very short period of time? Uh, and, and that is not as easy as uh, some in the media that, that comment on this think. And, the constraints are many uh, as to why this is quite challenging. Um, the first is that we don't have much time. The, if you look at the states that have converted to vote by mail, like Washington, Colorado, uh, Oregon, it took them a generation to make that kind of transition. We are asking states now in a period of a few months to take the measures that it took a lot of other states uh, decades to achieve. 
Second is that this requires a significant commitment of funds. Congress has a has a, a portion uh, four hundred million dollars. That's you know by you know one zero off of what we need uh, in order to pull off this election. Um, we desperately need more money uh, to go to the states and localities to make the transition to mail balloting and to make uh, polling places safer. The third is that we need people. Um, and this is a particular problem that I'll talk about in, in more detail later, but that um, you know, many jurisdictions right now are finding that um, the majority of their poll workers are unwilling to show up on election day. And that's not surprising given that the average age of poll workers in the United States is 70 years old and, the, and that community is then gonna end up being most vulnerable uh, to the virus. And so we need a significant number of people uh, to, to substitute for those who are unwilling to serve uh, as the many volunteers that we need uh, in the polling places and to help out election officials in the process of dealing with mail balloting. The fourth is we need resources and materials. That seems kind of obvious, but if you're a state that has not been running elections by mail, there is stuff that you need to buy in the next few months that you haven't had to buy before, whether it's high volume scanners and sorters, or whether it's extracting machines, or even the paper that you need for, uh, the special paper you need for ballots and ballot envelopes. None of this is, as we say in the election field, rocket surgery. I mean, you could, you could pull this off with, um, uh, you know, with ease if you had enough time. But we're running into the same kinds of resource constraints on the election front that we are with ventilators and face masks, which is that the elections industry is competing uh, and each state within the election in the, in, that is running elections is competing with each other for the necessary equipment to run the election in the fall. Of course, you can't talk about election reform generally without talking about the partisan and polarized context in which it is taking place. And so Democrats and Republicans um, are obviously quite far apart uh, at the national level on what needs to get done. I should say that as you go farther down the chain toward the localities, um, there's much greater consensus about what needs to be done. And these are folks who are really just dealing with resource constraints and logistics. And I do want to sort of impress upon you all that while we spend a lot of time thinking about vote suppression and about the partisan context in this, that the logistical challenges are themselves you know massive for these states to undertake and so that while we cannot you know uh, uh, disentangle this from the fact that that the democrats and republicans have very different views about what uh the uh, on the questions of integrity and fraud versus access nevertheless on these questions of of um logistics and actually just pulling off the elections that those are the ones i'm going to be focusing on in this but i'm happy to talk about more uh, on the partisan stuff in the in the questions um and then just to give you again the background against which all of these election administration questions uh are foregrounded that there are just structural impediments in the american political system that make massive election reform like the kind we're about to undertake very difficult the incredible decentralization of uh, our election administration, where not only does it go down to the national, to the state level, but also to roughly 10,000 independent jurisdictions that make decisions on the ground and in contact with the voters. There are problems in the contracting and procurement process, like the supply chain issues I was mentioning before, um, but trying to stand up a massive uh, vote by mail operation requires, um, you know, a lot of contracting and procurement. And it requires that we change our laws in order to uh, accommodate these new methods. And that is often you know, quite cumbersome as we saw most recently in Wisconsin. And finally, there's the unpredictability of the pandemic itself. So that um, one of my chief fears uh, going into this election is that sometime over the summer, we're going to get complacent and we're gonna say, oh, well, this election will be able to be run like elections before it. But then if the virus comes back in full force in September, it will be too late for uh, jurisdictions to try to accommodate that and, and deal with it. Um, so what are the solutions? They're not, they're not that complicated. We need to move as many voters by possible to mail, um, and we need to retrofit as many polling places as possible to avoid risk to voters and poll workers. Now, um, both of these solutions are predicated under the sort of larger principle that we need to figure out a way to enhance social distancing 
with voting. And so either you are going to have to have people at home, uh, literally distant from any other person while they vote, or you're going to have to ensure that the way that they have been accustomed to voting are, is retrofitted in order to um, accommodate the, the necessary social distancing of the virus. Now, this is not as easy as people think as I'll, as I'll go through. Um, and it's important also to understand that these are polls on a continuum. This is not a dichotomous choice between, say, mail balloting on the one hand and polling place voting on the other. There are intermediate options such as mailing people ballots or, or uh, having them fill it out at home and then depositing them in a, in a county facility or in something that looks like a polling place, uh, but that the time they would take in terms of voting would be done away from the polling place. Um, and almost all jurisdictions, almost all of them are going to have some mix of the two. Um, and, and there are different groups and different constituencies who want different types of voting, and we need to sort of recognize that. But, but just again, as background, let's talk about the way that people have been voting in the United States over the last generation. Uh, and as you can see, there's been a shift in uh, the way that Americans vote so that uh, roughly 40 or so percent and probably would have been closer to 50 percent this time uh, would be, have been voting early or absentee. Um, and that mail voting has generally been increasing over, over that 20 year period or 16 year period. Um, but it hasn't been increasing uniformly around the United States. And so for the most part, the uh, phenomenon of mail balloting is a Western phenomenon. So as I mentioned before, Washington, Oregon, and Utah, uh, as well as um, Hawaii uh, and now Co and Colorado as well, have now moved to all vote by mail, where every voter gets a ballot in the mail, whether they ask for it or not, because that's the way they run the election. Um, in addition, some counties in California have moved to all vote by mail, and it's, some, and it's likely that many more will uh, in the fall as well. And then um, you have in places like California and Nevada, although they aren't all vote by mail, they end up casting roughly two thirds of their votes by mail. Um, and so you can see from the map that, you know, that, that the, the heavy vote by mail states are in the West. But then there's great diversity in the rest of the country as to whether an excuse is required for uh, having voting absentee or not. And so you can see in the gray states uh, that these, these are states that, were, that provide for no excuse absentee voting. Um, and then you can see in the uh, mostly the southern states, states that there is um, you know, in the, the middle of the country, that there is uh, usually a re an excuse required. Okay, and so one of the one of the ways that we could reform the mail balloting process in those states that require excuses is to make clear that COVID is itself an excuse, so that everyone is able to to vote by mail if they want, if they're concerned about going to a, a polling place. Um, but it's, it's, even that map doesn't quite capture the rates of mail voting that we see in the country. Um, because as you can see from this chart, and I know it's, it's hard to, to see because so many rows, but I've tried to put arrows next to what I think are ma the main battleground states. But you see places like North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, and Georgia, right, are 6% or fewer of their voters are voting by mail. Um, and so for them to stand up a massive vote by mail operation by the fall is going to be quite challenging. Uh, other states like Michigan and Florida, you know, more than a quarter of the population voted last time in 2018 with, by mail. Um, and so it'll be a little bit easier for them to expand, but still to go to all vote by mail would be a, a quite challenging um, logistical operation for them. Um, and so let me, I'm not gonna go through all of the little steps that, that are involved in terms of go, uh, voting by mail, um, but I want to impress upon you the, the, the challenges that, um, that the jurisdictions face and, and their challenges of the procedures, the procurement and the people. Um, as I said before, that this requires legal changes in the relevant jurisdictions that um, you know, the, the, you have to get consensus among the, you know, the governors and the legislatures to make these changes. Several states, we've seen that they don't have that consensus. Um, 
you also have to do all the changes in the notifications on the websites and all the election communication from the state level to the county level has to be up to date because if voters are looking for information and they get the wrong information there, they won't uh, be able to vote. You have to make the procurement decisions, as I mentioned before, reg regarding the actual ballot paper and the equipment. But as, as I want to emphasize, it's not just that states are competing against each other for the relevant election equipment. It's also that the election industry is competing with the rest of the economy for other kinds types of equipment, like personal protective equipment. So that the same face masks and personal and, and uh, you know, uh, face guards that we need in other areas of life, uh, we're gonna need in a massive way for to run elections. Um, and so that we need to sort of build up the capacity now to satisfy the poll workers and the election officials with that kind of protective gear. Um, even something as mundane as ballot drop-off boxes, which I, I spent an hour today talking to people about how you procure ballot drop-off boxes. There's only a limited number of firms that produce that kind of material um, and they're, or that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of equipment. And um, all the jurisdictions are now asking them for it at the same time. Again, this, if we have time and if jurisdictions act now, they're gonna be fine. But if they wait until July, they're, they're gonna be out of luck. And then as I mentioned before, they have to hire the temporary staff. But it's even more complicated than that. And I just wanna highlight the, the stuff that I put in bold here about the different sort of aspects of the mail balloting process that might not be um, readily apparent to the, to the general population. The ability to, to run a mail election is totally contingent on the cleanliness of the address list that the jurisdiction has. And what I mean by that is that you have to have a very accurate address list of who lives where. And you might think, well, that's, of course they do. They have to have that to run elections. Well, if you're running elections with polling places, you can sort of have an address list that's sort of good enough for government work, uh, where you might, you know, it's not critical that they live in the exact house and it's not critical that you have all the right information about the address. Um, and any kind of disputes over the address can sort of be resolved in the polling place between the voter and the poll worker. Um, but if you, if you run an all mail election, you have to make sure that the right ballot gets to the right person at the right address. And one of the things, there are several things that make that complicated, but, but take a jurisdiction like Los Angeles, uh, which is exceptional, but, the, but it, it sort of is instructive, which is that um, some of these jurisdictions are managing not just hundreds of thousands of ballots, Los Angeles is doing millions, but 100,000 ballot types, meaning that the ballot, the type of ballot is different because of all the different districts that a person can live in. They live in a different congressional district, a different state legislative district, a different city council district, judicial district, school district, and the like. And so the number of ballots that need to be managed by these jurisdictions is many different thousands. And each person in the jurisdiction, right, has to get the exact right ballot. Multiply that also, say, in a place like Los Angeles, where they're dealing with over a dozen languages, right? And so you have to make sure you get the right ballot in the right language to the right voter. Um, and there's simply, there are some states, I was talking to some today, that are not going to be able to clean up their list enough by the fall to make sure that uh, they can get the level of accurate accuracy for the, for the voters. Um, and, and, and one other thing to think about here is that the, um, the, the COVID pandemic it's not just the, the medical side of this, but it's also the economic fallout from the pandemic has election implications because we are going to see millions of people changing addresses in the next five months as we approach the election because of financial woes and, and people living with, with other relatives and the like. And so that is often not a problem if you're running a polling place election, but if you're running one with mail, it's going to be more and more difficult to get the right ballot to the right people. Um, now, uh, looking at the second uh, 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 sort of highlighted point here, thinking about the Postal Service. Now, unlike virtually every uh, uh, developed country in the world, um, the United States does not have a central election authority in Washington that oversees the election. We've got the Election Assistance Commission, which is a really sort of bare bones organization that deals with 
um, certain kinds of uh, stuff with election administration and technology. We've got the Federal Election Commission, which deals with campaign finance for the most part, but we don't have a national election authority. Um, but in an election where the majority of the votes are cast by mail, the Postal Service becomes that national election authority, right? And so all the stresses that the Postal Service is under um, then have election related consequences. Now, in talking to people, representatives from the Postal Service, they're not worried about, they, they say they, they're up to the task that, that they're going to be able to deliver the election mail. They recognize the uh, priority in this. Uh, but um, as you know, you may see in the stories lately about uh, how the Postal Service needs 30, 40 billion dollars uh, to stay afloat because they're losing uh, a lot of the money that they need um, from the uh, you know, advertisements and the bulk mail that they that they send. Um, so all of the stresses that are on the Postal Service then have downstream consequences uh, for the election. The last point I want to point out is this this on this issue of signature verification. Um, we here at Stanford uh, it, it ran a policy lab, as it turns out, fortuitously in the fall on a very narrow topic on the verification and curing of signature mismatches on absentee ballots. You might wonder why were we worried about that in the fall? And the answer is because my students were worried about it. And so I taught a policy lab on that. And so this, what, just to be clear about what the issue is, uh, in vote by mail states, you have to sign the outside of the envelope and then when you mail the ballot back and um, that signature is then matched with the signature that is on file at the election authority right um, now uh, when i was the research director of the president's commission on election administration one of the people who testified who uh, was running elections in los angeles who testified before the commission said that you know it's becoming more and more difficult to deal with um, signatures because um, they don't teach cursive in school these days and young people don't really have a, a, a signature that they use all the time. And so I mentioned that story in my class um, with uh, in my law of democracy class. And some of the students also were, ended up working um, um, on uh, for some interest groups dealing with a new piece of legislation in California called the Every Vote Counts Act. And, and so the students wanted to do a policy lab just on this question of matching signatures and seeing whether um, what the rules are in California, how the different uh, California jurisdictions are dealing with signature mismatch issues. And so we have a hundred page report that you can, that you, if you go to my Twitter feed at personally, uh, you can see, and I'll, I'll put up there uh, again, um, just on this one question. But this is where the rubber sort of meets the road in the access and integrity problems when it comes to mail balloting. How states decide whether to match these signatures that appear on the mail ballot can have dramatic implications for whether uh, votes will be counted or not. Um, and just to be clear, even under the current regime, we know that millions of absentee ballots end up not being received by voters, end up not being cast by voters on time, and then um, many don't end up being counted as a result of the signature mismatch. Again, it's, it's one of these kind of esoteric things that you don't really think about until you, you talk to election administrators and realize how challenging it is for them to uh, sometimes match up these signatures. And it's usually no fault of the voter. One of the ways that we match signatures when it comes to vote by mail, right, is the, the, the signature that's on file is usually the one that is um, at the DMV. And if you've ever been to the DMV and you've signed, you know, your name, you probably are not thinking, well, this is a potential disenfranchisement action here. But, you know, when you sign on those electronic pads, it's often like you're signing with crayon, but that's the signature against which the signatures for voting uh, end up being measured. So there are other concerns with vote by mail. Obviously, the president has talked about fraud and, and, and that's become quite a trope. There's very little fraud when it comes to vote by mail. Um, but in thinking about the, the issue of fraud generally, it's, I actually think that the, the issues of fraud and disenfranchisement or integrity and ac access become a little bit molded in the context of vote by mail. One of the things that we saw just this last year in the 2018 election was a congressional district in North Carolina where um, the, the campaign actually collected or what we say harvested ballots uh, from um, um, some voters and then deliberately chose not to, to, to mail or, or contribute, take those 
ballots that it thought were not favorable to the campaign into the um, into the state election authority or the local election authority. Um, there are ways to commit malfeasance in the mail balloting uh, uh, system that are different than in the uh, regular mail balloting in the regular polling place voting. And we need to pay attention to that. It requires that states know who it is, who's, who's handling the ballots at all time, good chain of custody rules and the like. Uh, but as I said before, there are millions of votes that are lost as a result of the mail balloting process, failure to receive ballots, errors in casting ballots, errors in rejecting ballots. It's also the case that different types of people are more or less likely to navigate the vote by mail system. I mentioned before how it's critical that you be at an address that has been that you've been at for some time. Um, and also older, whiter voters, uh, more educated voters tend to be the ones who are able to navigate vote by mail. Democrats in recent elections have, have cast more votes by mail, but a lot of that is because Democrats live in states that have all mail balloting, like in the West. Um, my colleague Andy Hall in the political science department here at Stanford just released a survey, or just released a study that you can see in the Washington Post that shows that, that neither party actually has an advantage when it comes to mail balloting. And, and also, because this has become so partisan, uh, the issue of mail balloting, I think it's important to understand that none of us really know how the campaigns are going to react when it comes to mail balloting, how, how they will mobilize voters. And it really will just depend on how the campaigns uh, are going to work within the rules that the states uh, uh, set. But in addition to actual fraud that the uh, people are concerned about, there is this generalized concern about just perception of wrongdoing. And, and so this is where I put back my, on my hat dealing with um, disinformation and the like. We, since we have been um, up to our ears in questions of the pandemic and voting, the, we've sort of put to one side some of these other questions that we thought were gonna dominate the conversation in the 2020 election, such as, foreign interference in elections or um, disinformation or other you know, stuff related to, to malfeasance with political advertising. Now, none of that goes away just because we're focused on the pandemic. In some ways, it's even worse uh, because, there are, because we're all attached to our screens uh, for 12 hours a day. And so the, um, the, 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 the possibility of misinformation and disinformation in the mail balloting or, or uh, other procedures related to this election becomes even more important. But what I wanna emphasize, and I'll get back to this at the end, is that while there's the possibility of actual wrongdoing, the, the mail balloting process uh, is ripe for, for uh, communications that will instill, instill doubt in the American people about the legitimacy of the election. Um, because as you will see, you know, at, at what, what we call the blue shift, uh, from this last election, where if you see that on election night, one person is leading, but then the absentee ballots, the late arriving ballots, then are favoring another uh, candidate, it's often fashionable to say, all right, well, that represents something wrong with the election. That represents fraud that the election officials were messing with the, the ballots. Um, it's absolutely critical that the media, the responsible media, understand that this election has to be covered in a very different way than previous elections. Uh, and that in many ways, we should not be calling victors on election night, that we need to wait uh, to make sure all the ballots are in, because otherwise these concerns, this perception of wrongdoing uh, will be taking hold. Um, so we need safe polling places in, in addition to mail. Um, voters in general are reluctant to change. Um, mail vo voting, as I said, requires some training and education. There are certain subsections of the population, particularly blind voters, but others voters with disabilities who absolutely need uh, to vote in some kind of facility with some assistance. Uh, and so we need to uh, accommodate them. And so how do we create safe polling places in the midst of the pandemic? Well, it requires people, places, and things. We need more poll workers. As I said before, I have an op-ed in the New York Daily News a week or two ago about how we should be mobilizing the National Guard to help out with the polling places. This was something the governor of Wisconsin did for their election. They brought out roughly 2,400 uh, poll workers. Uh, and uh, my, one of my students, Tom Westfall here, has helped leading up the Healthy Elections Project. He's also served in the Army. Uh, and I wrote this article saying, here's how 
uh, jurisdictions are going to have to try to get these bodies uh, through the door uh, to help them out with as poll workers. Um, and that's not just for, for in-person uh, voting, but also for the mail balloting process, we're gonna need a lot more people. We need safe polling places. This is the, the thing that concerns me the most actually, is that we are losing in some jurisdictions, half of the polling places because they are unwilling to open during the pandemic. So schools, uh, senior living centers and firehouses, which are often the, the ubiquitous polling places, if they close themselves up to voters in the fall, then we have a real problem. Um, we might be able to find other facilities like big box stores and the like, but one thing that we as political scientists know is that the consolidation of polling places and the moving of polling places has a measurable impact on voter turnout. Because if voters go to their polling location that they've gone to uh, you know, for many elections, they find out that it's not, it's not open for business, um, a lot of them are gonna say, well, I'm not gonna waste time trying to figure out where the polling place uh, is. Finally, oh, and I should say that, that with respect to polling places, there are fewer and fewer places that are suitable for polling with social distancing. So that you have to have places where long lines can, um, can be accommodated, hopefully indoors. Because remember in places like Milwaukee, Detroit and Philadelphia on November 3rd, uh, the weather could be such that you won't be able to allow a, uh, you know, a line to snake around the block and these lines are going to have to, you know, you're going to have to space people out by six people or so uh, between them. And then, as I said before, we need to deal with the supply chain issues uh, with respect to, to voting. And so we need massive education and outreach. We need to lengthen the voting period to avoid surges, to avoid, avoid lines, to promote early uh, voting so that we can stretch out the sort of flow of voters into the polling place. We need to think about other ways of voting that don't require lines like appointments voting, like where you take a number, you know, like we do at the butcher or something, and so that you don't have to wait in line, but you can specifically come to vote at a particular time. Um, and then we need to have greater voting with physical distance, so what we call curbside voting, if you were able to drive through, like you can see in the picture on the right, uh, in order to vote. Uh, and we need to have a whole series of products that are made like voter, ma like I voted masks or pens that uh, will be disposable that we need to accommodate for this election. Um, one of the interesting things, if you look on the Election Assistance Commission's website, they have a whole, now the election machine manufacturers have put up slides like this, how to clean your election, so your election machines, right? And so the, um, the, the election manufacturers now are trying to say, well, here's how you disinfect a, an election machine, but you got to do it in a particular way so you don't ruin the touch screen, so you don't uh, mess up the equipment. Uh, another example of new problems that we're going to end up having to deal with. The same with the CDC, which has put out its guidance on uh, polling places um, and how to uh, maintain social distance and the like. But I should emphasize that this can be done. South Korea last week pulled off an election with adopting these kinds of measures, you can see the, the rules that they had in place for the South Korean election that led to, you know, different voters um, be, being having their temperature taken um, at, the, at the polling place, right? They would have Purell, they would have masks that would be worn by the voters. They even had separate facilities that would be uh, for election observers you hear who are, who are seeing, you know, getting their temperature taken in. Um, you can see that even for people who were COVID positive, they had um, particular facilities where they could vote uh, in private uh, without possibly infecting others. Um, but as I said, all of this does come down to the most important resource, which is time. We need more time to vote. We need more time to administer the election. We need more time to count votes because mail balloting is going to take several days. And we need more time to announce the results. And so responsible media really needs to adopt a different norm for this election than they did before. Now, I'm under no illusion that every website that's you know, uh, calling these elections is going to wait until the final results before they call them, but at least the responsible media organizations need to. And I should just end by saying we here at Stanford are um, really taking this uh, very seriously. And so we start up this Caltech, this, um, uh, Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project. We have about a dozen uh, students in the law school and about 35 undergrads who have already signed up. 
uh, to really grapple with the problems that the jurisdictions are facing and to uh, try to propose common sense solutions. But it's going to be a wild ride, uh, as is often the case with these elections. Uh, and so stay tuned, and I'm eager to take your questions. Thank you very much, Nate. Um, so I have uh, about 10 people in the queue right now. Just as a reminder, if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand uh, in the right hand side uh, where the participants are, or you can send me the question privately in chat, uh, and I'll be able to unmute you to ask your question. Um, so the first question is from Alan Gott Health, and I'm just trying to find his name on my screen so I can unmute him. As you're doing that, I'll tell you what someone put in the chat, uh, whether whether people can have a copy of my slides. And yes, um, I'll put them up on Twitter at personally. Just go to at personally. I'll put them up right after this uh, conversation. Alan, I'm trying to unmute you on my end, but you may need to unmute yourself as well. That doesn't seem to be working. So I'll, let me just ask you uh, Alan's question, Nate, uh, which is he wanted to know where does the four billion dollar estimate come from? Well, so um, this let me tell you my conversations with with uh, so the Brennan Center estimates it at around two billion dollars. That is, I think, what what is minimally uh, necessary. It depends on whether we are thinking about just the added expenses for making this transition or whether we need to. Um, account for the fact that that the states are rolling back money for election administration at the same time. And so uh, um, in my conversations with sort of some media medium sized states, they say it's between 50 and $75 million per medium sized state. Now, I, my, um, my inclination is to, to focus the efforts on the battleground states, but it's really difficult to come up with um, you know, federal legislation that would privilege just the battleground states in election administration. And so pulling this off in New York and California, which are where the stakes are much lower nationally, uh, is also going to cost, you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay. Uh, the next question um, came from um, somebody that couldn't submit the, uh, who can't turn their audio on. So they wanted me to ask you, um, what about the possibility of using a database that would cross match uh, voter registrations from state to state as a way of preventing um, potential double registration? Uh, and why is it that it seems like one political party favors measures like that and the other political party doesn't? Well, so th this was one of the recommendations of the Presidential Commission on Election Administration on which I served, and, and that actually exists now. It's called the ERIC project, E-R-I-C, the Electronic Registration Information Center. And so not all states are a part of that, but uh, roughly half the states are. And uh, there's some new states like Texas and Florida that joined for uh, this election. And so the, being a part of ERIC means that if you move from one state to another, that then you'll be taken off one role, the, the roles in one state and you'll be put on uh, in another. So that is, that is in the, uh, that is happening right now, and it is a, you know, a important measure to try to make sure that uh, registrations registration lists are clean. Okay. The next question came from uh, Wei Yang, so I'm going to try to unmute you. Wei, I think you're unmuted now. If you want to yeah. ask your question. Yep. Thank you. So I have two questions. One is. Um, how does moving to vote by mail change campaign strategies for the last few weeks or days before the election day? And the second question is legally, what would it take to postpone the election? Okay, good question. Let me do the second one first, since I probably should have dealt with that in the, because I always get that question. So the election date is fixed by federal statute. Okay, so the election date, it cannot be changed uh, except by Congress. However, the um, Constitution vests in state legislatures the ability and the power to determine the manner by which uh, electors are chosen for the Electoral College. In theory, 
you could have some state legislatures that decide that they will, before the election day, appoint the electors to the Electoral College. This was one of the issues that came up in Bush versus Gore under the possibility that there would be competing slates of electors from, say, the Florida Supreme Court and the Florida uh, legislature or governor and the like. And so um, you cannot cancel the election per se, but you could have the, the Florida or Florida, uh, a state legislature can decide to take on its own the possibility of um, uh, appointing those electors. Now, the, the president, though, doesn't have the power to do this. You know, you don't, can't impose like a national emergency and do it. Uh, and in terms of delaying things, in the Constitution, it is still the case that January 20th is the end of the term of office for the president and January 3rd for, um, for Congress. And so the, the, um, the Constitution has something to say also about uh, the ends of, of certain terms. And then it has obviously a uh, succession uh, statute that follows in its wake. So, so just to be clear, the president can't cancel the election. Congress could pass a law with the president's signature to change the election date. However, everything must be done before um, uh, you know, the, the Electoral College has to meet. That's also under something called the Electoral Count Act that specifies the dates um, by which uh, elections have to be uh, conducted to, for the slates of electors. Um, so what, how do the strategies differ for vote by mail? Well, in some ways you can, the, 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 uh, the campaigns are able to do things with vote by mail that they are unable to do with uh, polling place voting, like measure across you know, a, a substantial period of time, how many of their voters have cast ballots and the like, because different jurisdictions will allow campaigns to know whether the ballots have actually been cast or not. And so you don't have to run as uh, you know, massive a voting day operation if you wanna track the ballots and, and confirm whether people have voted or not. However, that can be labor intensive because the campaigns need to make sure that um, the voters are actually registered, that they are registered in a way that they will get the app, if it's an absentee ballot as opposed to vote by mail, that they are registered to get the absentee ballot, that they receive the ballot in the mail, that they then um, uh, vote the ballot in time, right? And that they vote it correctly because like I said, millions of people this election, mark my words, millions of people will make mistakes on their absentee ballot. It, it happens all the time. Uh, and then it has to be received by the jurisdiction and counted in time. One thing that happened in the Wisconsin case that went to the Supreme Court um, last week or two weeks ago now, is that um, roughly 10,000 ballots were never received by the voters who requested them. And so, uh, the, of course, the, the, you know, Wisconsin was just a complete disaster on so many levels, even though, by the way, they ended up having surprisingly high turnout. But the administration of that election was a perfect storm of pathologies. And so what they ended up doing, because it wasn't even clear the day before the election whether they were going to be uh, pulling off the election. Um, but uh, we, need, we, we need to make sure that we don't have many more Wisconsin's uh, in the fall, and that that requires that we um, make sure that voters are able to get their ballots on time, that they're able to re return them on time. And that requires massive education by the campaigns and by the jurisdictions to make sure voters uh, turn in their ballots with enough time that they will be received uh, by the jurisdiction. Okay, so the next one comes from one of our undergraduate fellows, uh, Ariana Togalang. Hi, Nate. Um, thank you for like a really great presentation. I'm curious as to what the impacts of voting behaviors in the long term would be. Like, do you see more um, voting by mail in the future as a result of how we deal with this upcoming election or of increase or decrease levels of voter turnout? I think what's going to happen is that there, the states that were on the precipice of adopting vote by mail, this is going to be sort of pushing an open door. I think that this will lead California, for example, to move much more rapidly to vote by mail. And I think some of those Western states like Arizona and the like, you're gonna end up with a lot more vote by mail. It will also mean that a lot of these states that have had excuses required for absentee ballots are going to amend their laws permanently so that you don't need excuses. And so we should expect that, while you know, this might be the high watermark for the, in the near term, for vote by mail, that the changes that are made now are going to stick in some places. Part of it is also that, that voters are going to become accustomed to it. 
right? And campaigns are going to become uh, accustomed to it so that we will see uh, some shifts uh, based on that. But I, but I want to emphasize, you know, that there are good reasons, right, to have both polling places as well as mail balloting. We need to have both um, um, uh, to service uh, the voters because, well, most of the, the 100 to 200 people who are on this, on this call right now um, are paying a, you know, a lot of attention to the election and, and how it's going to be run. Most voters are not, and most voters only start paying attention in September and October. Uh, and so if you have an absentee ballot program that requires voter initiative, uh, a lot of them are not going to, uh, to do that. And so we need to sort of have these other options available. And for, to deal with these access and integrity issues that we were talking about before, there are simply going to be states that are going to, to tend toward polling place voting. And so we need to make sure there's enough money to make sure that those polling places are safe. Okay, uh, our next question came from Kate Klonick. Hey, Nate. Um, so we've talked about this before, but this is actually a follow-up on that question. Um, so we, uh, when you talked um, on our show about this topic, I really um, thought it was interesting that you had brought up the historic inequities that are um, happen as a result of male-only voting, and that there are certain types of, well, actually specifically that there are certain types of communities that disfavor male-only voting. Um, and therefore there are inequities that get borne out um, in the voting process, in the election process. So if this is the future, um, do I'm, I'm actually kind of curious. I, I think it could mean two things. It could mean that the norms shift and maybe communities really truly start looking at male-only voting or male voting in a different type of way. And there's a new type of PSA in public education that really happens around male-only voting, right? Which is, I think, the best possible scenario. Or you have um, an entrenchment of existing inequities that have are like and ideas that have already existed about male-only voting, and those only get deeper, and this drives us apart. And I just don't know if you have any idea about which is going to happen. So if you so a lot of the uh, racial bias or racially disparate impact when it comes to absentee voting is because of the different stages at which you need to sort of interact with the administrative apparatus. So the, um, uh, you know, if it's about request, take something just like in Wisconsin right now. So you need to have an ID, you need to have an ID and you need to mail it in with your absentee ballot, uh, not the ID, but a copy of the ID with your absentee ballot application. Now, a lot of people don't have scanners at home. A lot of people don't have copy machines, let alone during a pandemic, right? And so it's gonna be much more difficult. Same thing with issues concerning the digital divide, right? That it's gonna have a socioeconomic uh, disparate impact. Um, but if you are a state like Oregon and Washington and Colorado, where you are mailing out uh, the votes, the ballots to everyone, and they know that is the only way to vote, right? then that ends up being going to have a much less disparate impact. Um, but you're right that it requires training and acculturation and right, it's very hard to pull off in one fell swoop. And we see this, these kinds of socioeconomic biases whenever you roll out a new electoral reform that just requires certain uh, navigation of, um, of, of the bureaucracy. And one way to think about it is just, if you think about um, first time voters or infrequent voters and how they interact with the system and then those who are accustomed to doing so, right? And so to the extent that there are different populations that populate the infrequent voter pool or the um, new voter pool, that, that the, you're going to see those demographic biases. But again, it does depend on the campaigns, right? And so we shouldn't think about these biases or these, these disparities as static. Uh, it really does depend on how the campaigns mobilize their voters, whether they take responsibility for getting them registered and making sure that they turn out. And uh, different campaigns have done better with that. I mean, that, that actually is what explains the democratic, the, the view that, the, that mail balloting favors Democrats. And that's just because the Obama campaigns really went after mail voting. If you go back a decade, it was just, conventional wisdom that Republicans were favored in the mail balloting pool. Um, and it, because of all of these demographic uh, uh, biases. Uh, but now because we saw greater mail balloting in the all male states, plus the Obama campaigns really used it, um, we have this kind of familiar, this incorrect trope that's taken hold that it benefits Democrats. 
So our next one is from Singari Sashadri. Singari, are you still, are you there? Thank you, there you go. Okay. Um, yeah, I think you just alluded to this. Um, I was curious to hear your views on the impact, if any, on voter turnout or engagement with younger voters, the youth. Right, well, so this is an interesting question and I don't think we know the answer. Um, I think that, um, look, younger voters, I mean, the, the, the sort of three factors that we know as political scientists really affect voter turnout are age, education, and residency. And by residency, I mean whether you have lived in a place for a long time. Because if you've lived in a place for a long time, then you are more likely to be registered. And you know, the United States is uh, relatively unique among developed countries in that we require you to re-register to vote every time you move. And so younger people are more likely to be mobile, especially now with COVID, right? They might be living at home where they would be living somewhere else uh, otherwise. Um, and so, so on the one hand, there's that kind of disparate impact. On the other, maybe if you, people who are using the mobile tools and the, and the internet tools, you might see some uh, greater correction for that. But, you know, in general, the, the, the younger voters are, are hard to mobilize, right? Um, and, uh, you know, Biden is not Obama or Sanders for that matter, you know, where, where a lot of the younger voters had, had gravitated to those candidates. And so um, I would be surprised if you, you saw that. And I mentioned those, I mean, because the younger voters uh, are disproportionately Democrat right now, um, but that, uh, you know, that we'll, we'll see what the final voting pool looks like. Okay, next I have uh, Thomas Weissmiller. Uh, Nate, would it make sense to have everyone re-register to vote, to clear up the voter files? Well, I mean, if you did that, it would be, um, you would lose a lot of voters, right? I mean, just because the process of re-registering is one, just one more obstacle in doing, and, and the truth is one out of four Americans moves every two years. And so whenever, if you end up, uh, you know, just you clean up the voter files today, they're gonna to be outdated by the next election anyway. Um, but the, but you, there are ways, but there, there are ways under the National Voter Registration Act to purge voters. Obviously sometimes it's controversial um, for lack of voting. Um, and so, you know, we could do a lot more in terms of making the voter lists uh, clean. And what, what and if you look back at the presidential commission report that we wrote, states, there are good states and there are bad states when it comes to the cleanliness of their voter rolls. This is not something that, um, uh, you know, if, if you put effort into it, you can't deal with. Uh, it requires just aggressive uh, action by the state to make sure that, um, that the, the voters they have on, on the rolls are in the right place uh, and they actually are living there. And next we have Matthew Greenberg. Matthew there. Yeah, I, I don't know if you hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Oh, great. I, I just wrote in mostly, I wrote you my question, but the brief thing is, I know Milwaukee County just voted to allow uh, their 300,000 plus voters to be all vote by mail in the next election. Now, I don't know how things are county by county in Wisconsin, but is it likely, probable, possible for the Republican state legislature to override that uh, particularly since obviously increasing Democratic voters in Milwaukee could make a big difference in perhaps the most important swing state. Right. Well, so just to be clear about what Milwaukee did, they voted to mail absentee ballot applications to the city's registered voters. So the, the, it, what they will do, it's not that they're all going to be registered and going to receive mail ballots, it's that they all are going to get an application to uh, register to vote by mail. And so that I think is within, look, every state is different. I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert on, on, on Wisconsin election law, um, but, but that I think is in the purview of the jurisdiction of the, of the counties, at least it is in most places where if you're just mailing out stuff, if they were to just go to all vote by mail, that requires usually some state action, uh, you know, action at the state level. 
But let me, let me just use your question as a jumping off point to talk a little bit about lit election litigation and why election litigation this time is going to be a little bit bizarre. Um, we are, as election lawyers, familiar with the kind of fundamental right to vote litigation that you do in elections, whether it's over, you know, um, voter ID or, or things that clean the excessive purging of roles and the like. We don't really have a good way of litigating resource constraints and things like where they, you know, how many voters got the absentee ballots, whether there are enough polling places. You know, Milwaukee lost, basically closed 95% of its polling places for this last election for the primary. Madison, Wisconsin kept almost all of their polling places open, right? How do you litigate something like that is, is a really open question. And so these resource questions, I think, are, are really uh, disconcerting. So, so um, but, but I think that, yeah, the, the question of like mailing all voters a ballot, that's usually one that needs to be made at the, at the state level. Although we here in California, the state has allowed jurisdictions to mail every uh, person a ballot at the local level. That's, that's now allowed under, under state law in California. Um, so I got uh, two questions from someone whose audio isn't working. Um, the first is, um, what about the possibility of um, matching the state voter registration rolls against a federal citizenship database? Uh, and the second is, um, he wants you to address the perception that the um, epidemic's being used as a way of federalizing what's always been yeah. uh, a state function. So um, on the, the first point about citizenship, um, the, so, for, so it's not as if we, ha I mean, th th this came up in the debate over the recent census case that made its way to the Supreme Court. Um, you know, we don't, our citizenship list at the federal level is not exactly the most accurate thing in the world either, um, because we don't, you can use social security records, you can use naturalization records, but it's not as um, um, easy as all that. Uh, and so we, we do decentralize these, these questions uh, to the local level. Also, I should be clear that under the US Constitution, if a state wanted to allow non-citizens to vote, as has happened, for instance, in New York, school board elections a while ago, the state has the, uh, you know, the, the ability to do so. Um, but there's, remember, there's also other categories of voters who, who are citizens, but nevertheless are not allowed to vote, what, like in prisoners, um, people in the, under guardianship, um, uh, in those states that have felon disfranchisement, people are out of prison. And so just matching up with a federal database, even if it existed, would not be enough. Uh, and then the question about federalizing uh, the election. Um, well, so there was there there are federal laws that deal with voting. Obviously, the Voting Rights Act, Help America Vote Act, the National Voter Registration Act, the Uniform Overseas uh, Citizens Voting Act, um, and so we do have federal some federal legislation on this. I should say that um, it does. Not, so there was a bill that Klobuchar and uh, Wyden had put in for like national mail voting, um, and you know I'm concerned about. Uh, any massive change that we would make at the national level for uh, in how we vote just because I'm laser focused on how we actually just pull off this election. Um, and each state has different obstacles that they're dealing with. But if we were to have baseline rules for like number of days that we could have to vote, just like we have a national election day, I think that would be uh, okay. But, but the states are so different from each other, something that I've appreciated when I was working on the presidential commission that Alaska is very different than California, which is very different than Louisiana when it comes to, to the way they construct their ballots, the number of propositions on the ballots, that it's, it's actually very difficult to create national rules when it comes to elections. Um, but we could create some better federal baselines. I think that was all the time we have. Let me just unmute Michael McConnell here. I think you're on, Michael. Mike, oh. Mike, you've got to uh, unmute yourself now too, I think. Okay, I think you're good now. There we go. <laughs> so all I can do is, is thank you, uh, Nate, for uh, a fascinating uh, hour, and also to thank everyone who's, uh, 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 quote, attended, unquote, this first ever uh, remote uh, constitutional conversation. It, it really impresses me
that uh, this many people, I think, well, was it 135? Was that our final number, Chaz? Yeah. Um, uh, people were, were with us tonight, which I think speaks to the uh, depth of citizen interest uh, in this. And as I look over the names, I, I think, you know, maybe only a quarter or so of those are students. And, and uh, so this is reaching out into the community uh, as well. And uh, obviously many, uh, many Americans are, you know, are deeply concerned about this and um, interested in, in learning about the actual facts and what are the uh, options. So I thank you and I thank the attendees uh, and I thank Chaz for uh, doing all the hard work of, of organizing this. And uh, this has gone so well that we will almost certainly put on uh, other uh, remote events uh, in the future. I don't know how to lead the group and, and uh, we ought to do uh, very much, to have a, a Zoom clap. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Thank you.